You might want to start now we've been ready for 10 minutes or so. Welcome into the PFF NFL show. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. Sam, we've just been at odds this entire day. <laughs> It happens sometimes. We've just been yelling back and forth at each other. I think I'm mostly upset with you for spending your entire morning grading Johnny Football's spring football game. I didn't spend my entire morning doing it. I spent a brief amount of time grading his game. Then I had to record a bunch of other crap so that somebody else could plug in a not to 100 grade on it. Maybe that's why I'm a little upset with you. But uh, we'll get into some Johnny Football playing spring league. Is that what it is? Just the spring league? The spring league, yeah. He's the south team. Is that right? Sure. North or south, one of those two. They're just all directional teams. He's yeah. the south or something like that. We'll get into a little bit of what happened with Johnny Football, what could be happening with his NFL potential. And then one of our favorite ones, uh, most underrated players. We've touched on some of these guys periodically throughout the whole process, but I'm writing up our most underrated players, the guys that you really need to know from a PFF standpoint for the draft. Um, so I'll be writing that up this week. We'll go through some guys, names you need to know at the top end of the draft, Familiar names if you guys have been listening to the podcast, but also some mid and late rounders. And then we opened up the mailbag, and uh, we'll just fly through a few questions, maybe see what we have on the Twitter machine. Yeah, I let you do the script this week, and consequently you mailed it in and just asked for questions on Twitter. No, no, this is a well-structured show. This is a half-ass script. This is built around what, the, what the done. people want. You've got one, two topics, and then you've just gone, give me some questions, Twitter, and that's your script. Yeah, that's a good show. That's, that's, that's a good show. I'm also going to take a sip from my uh, mm, my PFF mug. That so you which should is tell well people placed on the uh, YouTube. You channel. should tell people what's in that because it is uh, it, it's a crime. It's some iffy hot chocolate, <laughs> iffy Keurig hot. It chocolate. It is Keurig hot chocolate, which it turns out is one of the worst substances that man has ever created, and yet. So I, I experimented, had a go out of it, and thought, no, 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 that's terrible. You. Took it and thought, you know what? That's okay. I'm going to have all that. I said, you bought a 12-pack. There's 11 left. I'm going to tap into you, these. Yeah, you are yeah. drinking through my twelve, my unused 12-pack of Keurig hot chocolate. There's just enough chocolate in here. There's, that, um, there's no chocolate. That has not never seen a cocoa bean of any description. It's a satisfying mid-afternoon drink. It, there's like there's pond silt of some kind in there with like chemical chocolate flavoring over the top of it. But it's in my PFF mug. It is. So makes it taste a little better. It's a good mug. Oh, it's a good God. mug. Hashtag Team Steve. All right, Sam. Let's okay, Johnny Football. Let's just get into this whole thing. Uh I was wondering why you were trying to track down Spring League film. I thought you were just curious. I was curious. I went through it, fly through his film. And a lot of times when we're watching games, we just, you know, we're PFF. We grade it in our head. Oh, that's plus this, that's minus that, or whatever. But you went through the trouble to go like 15 columns deep of data and information, and you collected all the info on what, 21 dropbacks, was it? Uh, something like that, 20-something. Okay, sure. wasn't many, but okay, what'd you, what'd you get? You get two minutes. You get two minutes of Johnny <laughs> football talk. Re let me know what you found, and then we're moving on. It was, it, nothing had changed. This was the Johnny Manziel that we saw at Cleveland. He still did exactly the same things. The good was there, the bad was there, and they were all in the same proportions they normally are. So we had a disastrous fumble. Um, Manziel tried to sidestep some pressure in the pocket and instead just allowed the guy to get hold of the ball, put it on the ground, turnover. So he's always been bad at that. So we've got like 500 and something snaps from his two seasons in Cleveland. In those 500 snaps, there are four very negative fumble grades where he's done exactly the same kind of thing, lost control of the ball when pressures arrived in the pocket, um, took three sacks in this game. I don't – people were sort of saying uh, to, you take three sacks as if it's on the quarterback, right? They're often not. He was bad in the pocket here, but there was a lot of pressure as well. He was under pressure 45% of his dropbacks in this spring game. Not that many of them were on him. Um, a couple were, but not all that many. There was the one disastrous uh, sack fumble. There was one horrendous decision and throw late in the game, um, which should have ended the game for the opposition. Uh, it should have been a losing attempt. He, in the end, had one more shot at it, but uh, it didn't matter. He still came up short. There were some good throws in there as well, but nothing spectacular. Um, just it, So it ended up with a poor grade. What did we say it was? 41.1? Was 44.1. 40, 44 uh, overall PFF grade, or passing PFF grade, excuse me. Um, but the, the the traits, this was all the same man's always seen, which is poor uh, ball security, <laughs> skittish in the pocket at best, should we say, yeah. um, wants to take off from a pocket, 
operates outside of the structure of the offense constantly will do some nice things when he does that. But if he's going to succeed at some point, needs to be able to eliminate the terrible throws like this horrendous decision. I mean, the first thing that stood out, I thought the speed of the game just looked too quick for him. So beyond the fact that, yes, he likes to break the pocket and the same traits were there, just the fact that when he was trying to break the pocket, he felt like, you know, the, the, the Christian Ponder syndrome, is that what you call it? Yeah. He's, he, look, he thinks he's a little more athletic than he, uh, than he really is c- compared to the speed of the game. That's what it felt like. I've always felt like Manziel's pocket movement and all that stuff would be an asset if used properly. But the thing I said to you, too, it's like you still need two, three, four more plays within the structure of the offense. Yeah. And then the broken plays become a complement to that piece rather than the main part. So of it. I looked it up. Um, the average NFL quarterback last season was outside of the pocket 14% of the time. Over was it that much? I told you way lower. You did. You told I me guessed. like five to seven or something. So I went and looked it up with actual numbers. That's my first guess that I've missed in a while. You are freakishly good at guessing numbers like that, other than this time. Um, the Manziel over his time in Cleveland was up at 26.2% or something, so almost double the average in terms of time he spends outside of the pocket. And when he was in Cleveland, so th- he did this all the way through his career at Texas A&M as well. The difference is he was disastrous when he was doing it at Cleveland. Right. There were some big plays in there, some deep uh, deep shots down the field, but his overall numbers were horrendous, like way lower than the NFL average. Um, completed 35% of his passes outside of the pocket, passer rating in the 40s, which is you know on the, the average NFL's passer rating outside of the pocket is in the 70s. So everything he was doing well, at Texas A&M, he was doing badly at the NFL level. Didn't look great necessarily doing it here. Made a few nice plays outside of the, the pocket. But I think the key, if he's going to have any successful NFL career, is can he stop making the really bad decisions? So can he improve the ball security? And can he stop making horrendous decisions at random? But having said that, clearly has an NFL caliber arm. What we've seen for him, from what we saw from him in Cleveland plus what we've later discovered in terms of what the hell happened to him. At the, at the minimum, what we saw in Cleveland has to be the guy's floor because he clearly wasn't trying that hard and he was busy drinking himself out of the league, at which point, That's a good point. how close to his potential could that really have been? And he wasn't, he wasn't incompetent. No. He wasn't, he wasn't terrible. Exactly. He wasn't great. At which point, or you great. have to say that if you're comfortable that he's turned his life around in any kind of meaningful way and you're a QB needy team right now, there's no reason not to sign this guy to a roster and take a look at him in training camp. Yeah, I mean that's that's the nature of the quarterback position, right? I yeah, mean, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to take a risk. Um, and you're saying all that despite this 44.1 grade. Yeah, because again, the spring league as you've always said, it's not necessarily about the overall grade, but how that grade is composed. So this grade, it's 44 because there's two terrible plays in there. There's the bad, um, there's the bad ball security with the the fumble. Which, if he's six inches quicker, that doesn't happen. So it's bad, but it, there's six inches in that one. Then there's the terrible decision. There's no excuses for that. It's just a bad play. And there's but a again, plays in there. it's one yeah. bad play. If you take that out, you've got all of his negative grade essentially is in two plays there. And there's some good stuff there as well. Well, all right. There's your exclusive. Uh, there's my two minutes exclusive. on Johnny Football. Uh, it's way more than two. <laughs> Uh, exclusive Johnny Football Spring League breakdown. You surprised me on a Monday morning. Like, hey, I'm just going through. It's not just to watch. Actually putting the grade to it. But you guys can check it all out at profootballfocus.com. Sam's breakdown on Johnny Football. Can we talk some draft now? Okay. Back to draft I season. I guess that's all right. All right, so I'm writing the most underrated players in the draft this week. That'll be up on profootballfocus.com. Um, I'm focusing more on those like mid and late round picks. But for this particular segment, let's let's rehash some of our top Guys that we feel are top of the draft names that are our names. These are our guys that we're that we're going to bat for more than say the consensus or what we think the consensus is. All right. Okay. Uh, so the Maurice Hart you guys if you guys have been listening, you've heard these names over and over. It starts with Baker Mayfield, of course. So a few other people might have him as QB one. We have him squarely as QB one. We're going to bat for him. Maurice Hurst our top interior defensive lineman by a wide margin, the mm-hmm. Michigan interior penetrator. Uh, Michael Gallup out of Colorado State, who we've discussed a lot internally. Because he's not special at anything, it's tough for us to you know, c- clearly call him the, the number one wide receiver. I think by the time our final wide receiver ranks come out, he's going to be in the mix, but I really think the difference between one through five or six is really small. 
and it's just dependent on style and um, you know where guys end up. But Gallup's just one of those other number two type receivers in this draft. Your boy Rashad Penny, San Diego State. Frank Ragnow, who you wrote up last week, Arkansas Center. And Josh Jackson out of Iowa. Again, I don't know if he's getting top 10 hype, but we feel comfortable enough to maybe put him in that top 10 mix at corner. Any other names that I'm missing or any other of those names you just want to expound upon there? No, for the top end guys, I think that all makes sense. Um, Gallup, just one of those guys that just does everything well. Um, he does have some relative athleticism concerns and there's nothing about him that's special but everything is good so if you don't need him to be a true number one receiver he can be a really good player to have on your team and you know the only question is what's that worth in today's nfl um it is interesting that a lot of people don't have him anywhere near the first round but i think he's done enough between his last season and between what he did at the senior bowl to belong in that conversation yeah, our, our top-graded receivers over the last few years, whether it's Tyler Lockett, Sterling Shepard, they've had pretty good success at the NFL level, and they've had varying degrees of where they go in the draft. Yeah. But Sterling Shepard, did he Oh, he went in the second, right? I, sometimes I'm yeah, confusing yeah. what actually happened in all my mock drafts <laughs> that had him in the first. He went in the second. Yeah. Lockett went in the second, I believe. I thought Lockett was third. Again, I'm, confu- I'm now I'm confused. I'm sorry, guys. I'm confusing what I actually did with what happened in reality. Sorry, now we can just fire up the Google machine, and as long as you talk here, and no oh, yeah, one, no one will know, to, even though I'm on camera. Here's a pro tip. Third I'm, round. Sam's looking things up while I talk. Third round. Third round. Lock. So we're, we've always been probably a round higher on our top-graded receiver, guys like Shepard, guys like Lockett, than others. Zay Jones was up there for us, even though he had that rough rookie rough, season. Yeah. He had a very rough rookie season and off season. So yeah, far, tried to jump out of a window. It's not, not normally With a good thing. By the way, for, remember that that was the same day I put the tight window throws tweet out there. <laughs> yeah, that was some bad timing. Yeah, but my timing wasn't bad. It was his timing. <laughs> it's his fault. I put out a tweet that said highest percentage of tight window throws, and he was like third on the list. And then eight hours <laughs> later, couple hours later, Zay Jones tries to jump out of a window, and exactly, you look like an asshole. Eight hours later. I, there were so many people like, hey, mental health is no joke. You know, you can't be making these jokes. You can't be doing that. And then luckily, a lot of you, I was, must have been a lot of our listeners and our viewers, they came to my defense and said, at least check the time stamp. Yes. Zay Jones, by the way, is a really great example for people that say, um, you know, isn't, it, isn't PFF grading a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? You know, it's in your interest to make the guys that you graded really well in college look really good at the NFL level. Right. Zay Jones graded fantastically in college. A lot of our guys were banging the drum hard for him, including me who saw him way back when we were analyzing Justin Hardy tape and said, I I don't like Justin Hardy, but I really like this other guy. He was merely Isaiah Jones back then. He was only Isaiah. Left off the tape then, comes in, we would like nothing better than for Zay Jones to grade exceptionally well as a rookie. Didn't. Graded like crap. Dropped the ball almost all of the time it came to him. Did almost (laughs) nothing of note. Over the season, the best play he made, in fact, may have been, was it, did he deflect it into somebody else's hands or did he catch the ball having someone else drop it? Either way, it was a freak touchdown. That was like the best thing he did all season. So we're definitely not <laughs> fudging the results. We graded no, Tay no, Jones very badly when he played very badly. It's legit. I mean, we don't, th- there's actually no motivation for us to fudge any grades because our play-by-play grades are in 30, maybe more. NFL team databases. Maybe they more. can check. Maybe more. A little cryptic. A little cryptic right there. At least thirty NFL teams have our play by play results in the databases. Our credibility means a lot more than uh than that. So um so those are our top end names, some of the guys to at least keep an eye on. Let's go to some of the more middle round guys that have graded well. And again, Sam, I, I know you follow enough football people that are evaluating the draft that there's literally no such thing as a sleeper anymore if you follow enough people watching the draft. You cannot pull up a name anymore that at least somebody hasn't been pounding the table for. Unless, you can't unlock people. Unless you're Emery Hunt. He goes deep. Emery does have some deeper names. He goes to Canada. When you're going to Canada, you can pull up names people don't know. Like multiple divisions of Canadian football, yeah. I think. Sometimes. At that point, you can go deep enough into the, into the tall grass that no one's following you. He has a lot of Ivy Leaguers in his top 20s. He does. I'll say that. Emery does. Uh, so... You know, he goes he goes deep and wide. So we feel like we've pulled up some names, but th- there's still people on my Twitter timeline and stuff like that that are discussing these people. There's but, also but, always, like, guys from that, you know, guys who follow that particular college. That, who they always are be banging out, the table. Oh, I've loved this guy for four years. It's like, yeah, that's the only team you yeah. watch. Of course. You're, you're a Tulane fan. Right. Of course you know who he is. He's your only good player. Well, there's your player. All right, Tulane. You gave it away. Give, give me your player here from Tulane. Perry Nickerson. I've got two Tulane players this year. 
Harry Nick is in the corner, and my boy Dontrell Hilliard, the running back. That's right. You're big Tulane. Tulane. Two of them. I'm uh, Appalachian State is where I'm finding guys this year. Yeah. That's my squad. But go ahead. Yeah, well, Parry Nickerson is a guy who Ben Stockwell, our uh, director of analysis, was jumping off the tape back when we first started doing college. That's how long Barry Nickerson has been playing. Um, was flashing on the tape back then. Still looks fantastic this year. Uh, has one of the best interceptions you'll see in 2017. Left all the way over a wide receiver deep down the field isolated in one-on-one coverage to bring in an interception the best part about that play by the way was like 55 yards down the field having leapt over the receiver to catch the ball then gets up and finger wags the quarterback from miles away (laughs) that that is that sold me on him i'm I'm, I'm not gonna lie that'll do it yeah so he ran a 4-3-2 at the at the combo that'll help too but but that was what kind of like let everybody know hey this is a guy this was after you had watched the tape and been like, man, that speed and those la- the ball skills late down the field, really impressive. But he had yeah, a few and, plays like that. And they hang him out to dry a lot in that coverage. Like he's put out on an island one-on-one with no underneath coverage. He's got to lock up on a receiver with no help covering a multitude of different routes, often in off coverage, which just sucks for a cornerback, um, and still played really well. The, the passer rating, NFL passer rating he gave up this season when targeted was 39, which is – Ever so slightly lower than throwing the ball into the dirt every play. Oh God, you need a new sh- you need a new shtick. I need a better. Th- that's the best number you can come up with. There's no better. It, as long as it's there, I'm going to keep using it. All right. Well, it still makes a point. Um, speaking of four three two forties, Tarvarius Moore, out of Southern Miss, safety, uh, could play a little bit of corner. He ran a four three two at his pro day, at six two about two hundred, and again a guy that. You know, maybe he's on people's radar because of this incredible workout. For us, what I love is when you have a guy that's got great production and then has a nice workout like that, and you start to put those two together, you feel a little bit better about the fact that this guy can play football, and oh yes, he's an NFL athlete as well. So Tavarius Moore is a guy, I think the rest of the draft community, I, I just saw Daniel Jeremiah talking about him, or Lance Zerline, I think it was Lance Zerline talking about him last week. And, you know, the NFL is just starting to get around to him as far as the, the media scouts or whatever. Um, but from a production standpoint, he was a first team All-American safety for us last year. Very productive on the field. He's a top 100 player for us, maybe even higher. Now the NFL is talking about maybe him being a, a day two guy. So you're talking about athleticism and production matching up at a position where I just I just love having these safeties that can do different things and, and more fits that bill. He's the next guy Bill Belichick is going to draft and no one has any idea who he is. No, because we know about him now. There's there's, oh, yeah? there's somebody further out there. There's definitely somebody further out there. A rugby player from Nova Scotia. Yeah, to be Bill's a 15 gonna draft year in the third special round. teamer. Just to, just to fill one special team role. It's like he's going to be the L4 <laughs> for me for 15 years. Uh, so Tavarius Moore, a guy that I've highlighted. Anthony Miller, the receiver out of Memphis who, again, you've got, uh, I think I saw Pete Prisco put him in his top 32. So d- you can find somebody that maybe likes a guy a little bit more than you if, y- if you look hard enough. But Miller's a guy that always kind of been on my radar since I saw him uh, being uh, Paxton Lynch's top guy. So we've mentioned him a little bit. I like Miller. One yeah. of those you know, 5'10", 5'11 receivers that plays bigger. Yeah, I, I went through his tape when we were stuck in the airport for like 127 hours last week um, en route to New York. I watched. I had a bunch of a bunch of receivers up and huddle watching the uh, watching the tape. Um, went through Anthony Miller, and he kind of reminded me a little bit of like a poor man's Odell Beckham. So you know, Beckham is spectacular. Yeah, he's not that good, but he does a lot of the same kind of things. He plays bigger than a guy that small. Will do those spectacular high pointing of the ball plays that Beckham does. Has good hands, good run after the catch skills. You know, can break tackles, all that kind of stuff. I, I liked what I saw. Uh, one guy I was going to put on this list, uh, by the way, our, our time at the airport. Yeah. I mean, we were delayed. What did we end up being delayed? About seven, eight hours? Seven-ish. No, yeah, yeah, whatever. Seven or eight hours, a lot. I got a free ice cream sundae out of it, though. You did? Which was great. Shout out to Graders over here in Cincinnati. You got a free ice cream sundae for it being your birthday like a week ago. Yeah, they honored it. I was just trying to use some Graders points yeah. on like a little ice cream sandwich. They're like, hey, you, you got a free sundae. All right, I'm doing the Sunday. I'm going to take my uh, my free Sunday. That worked out well. But we also had nice fifteen dollar vouchers to use, and also shout out to the guy that saw us. We're at uh, the uh, the restaurant. What what where'd we go? The little fast food place. 
Chinese the restaurant? Panda Express. Panda place? Express. Somebody there you go. somebody tweeted me that they saw us at Panda Express, and I didn't want to admit that we went there, but it was only because we had this free fifteen dollar voucher. But I really want to give a shout out to the guy who <laughs> bought forty five dollars worth of candy. Yeah. For him and his two kids, because everybody got a fifteen dollar voucher, you had to use it in one place. Well, there was a lot of strategizing going on around these fifteen dollar meal vouchers, right? right? Because they came with conditions, multiple conditions, not just here's your fifteen yeah. bucks, go nuts. No alcohol. It was one: you can't use it on the graders' ice cream or booze, right? Frankly, that's the two. That would be number one and two on my list. That's kind of. Yeah, if I hadn't already already downed a Sunday, that's where I would have gone as well. I might have given it a shot anyway. Yeah, why not? I mean, you've got eight hours to kill. Why not? It's free. So no no ice cream, no booze, right? Then you couldn't get any money back with it. It was 15 or nothing, right? So we had these two meal vouchers, and now we're thinking... The other thing is you could use it either on the meals, either places like Panda Express, or in the snack places, the gift shops, the snacks, and that kind of stuff. So we thought, well... In order to get the maximum of your fifteen dollars, we're going to need to find a cheap place to get food because otherwise, there's no way we're getting two meals for fifteen dollars. Then we use the other one to get the snacks. So that's why we hit up the Panda Express. You and I, we had our we had our entrees. What was it? You know, chicken and a and a, a rice thing. Yeah, it was like fourteen something. Exactly. So we, you had we got the cheap entree. Yeah. Almost maximized it. Then hit up the snacks. Whereupon we came to the greatest invention of the twenty first century which was mini Starbursts that had been pre-unwrapped and put in the bag. So, yeah. like, cool Starbursts widget. are amazing, but at least 30% of any negative surrounding Starbursts is the fact that you have to unwrap all the little things individually, and that's just a giant pain in the ass. These were all unwrapped for you and put in the bag. Same taste, same flavor. And it was just a case of fistfuls of these things to keep you going. Yeah, that kept you going the entire trip. Yeah, pretty much. You had, those, you had those going for a while. So they it was a good. fun trip. And uh, we had to be strategic about our fifteen dollars, and we 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 basically ran into a woman at the Panda Express, and she said, "Hey, my husband took my two kids. They just and eaten. spent the forty five dollars, yeah. the so three vouchers at the candy. They store. had just eaten by the time they broke out the free meal vouchers. So they went, well, the only way I can get this money is I'm going to go spend forty five dollars worth of candy and bring it with me. I'm just proud of that guy. I think that's dad of the year type material right there. So we gave him a, a good head nod, a thumbs up, a little shout out when we when yep. we got on the plane. Um, anyway, uh, we were looking at more mid-round <laughs> type of guys. We mentioned Tarverius Moore out of Southern Miss, Anthony Miller out of Memphis, Perry Nickerson out of Tulane. One other name to mention, Duke Ajiafor out of Wake Forest, a guy who uh, isn't the greatest athlete in the world. He's an edge defender. He's not that crazy bendy guy. He's not Gumby <laughs> off the edge, crazy bendy guy. Crazy bendy Six, guy. 6'4", 275, but he wins with his hands extremely well. And I feel like guys who win with their hands – that's like one of the most underrated uh, – th- that's one of those traits in the NFL draft that just goes overlooked sometimes because you're all about the first step and the turn and all, the three-cone Mike Loves and all that stuff. But just winning, knowing how to win blocks, pretty important. And gf 4 has got a couple years of good production. Well, most of the time when you take a guy out of college, one of the things you're anticipating doing is teaching him how to win with his hands so that he can take the next step and become a well-rounded pass rusher. It's often way harder than you think. It's one of those things that NFL coaches and teams think they can teach and a lot of the time struggle to do it. Therefore, these guys never actually materialize into anything because they never learn. Right. But if so that you take the athlete and then you teach him how to win with his hands and now you suddenly got a really good pass rusher. But if you have a guy that can already win with his hands and that's why he's productive, the chances are that means he's going to be productive at the next level anyway because that's how he's winning. And then it doesn't really matter where he is on the athletic spectrum because he's already winning blocks at a fairly consistent rate yeah right i mean this goes back to this whole what's a guy now versus potential somebody asked that in the twitter questions maybe we'll touch on it briefly and generally the whole what can you teach you know that these guys do not have endless amount of coaching time right. there's only so much stuff you can teach a guy to do if he's not already proficient at doing it feels like the nfl needs to recalibrate what they can actually teach and make better at the next yeah. level. I mean, that would be one of the big at all positions. That would be one of the big self scouting things that any NFL team should be doing right now is figuring out how easy it is to teach and coach specific attributes, specific traits um, going forward. Because realistically, that should be shaping how you build rosters. Is identifying what it is you can even teach people, and then only looking at people that are deficient in that area. I'm writing this down. This has always been on my mind these last couple of years, but even just as we talk it out further and further, 
it is so crucial and so in, so important. Yeah, you, we t- you make a note of that. You can do that when you're GM, and I'll tweet about it afterwards. So you you get it right now. I like how you're just you understand your role mm. and falling into place. Yeah. Um, I'll continue to make the decisions as GM, and you continue to make me look good. Yeah, I'll tweet about it later. On Twitter. Uh, some day three guys. Uh, these guys, they, I don't even know if they're going to get drafted, a couple of these guys I'm going to mention. But we've got a classic case of production versus athleticism, which is you know building on what you just said. And these and Justin Lawler from SMU uh, and Javon Roland Jones out of Arkansas State, these guys might be so unathletic, it's <laughs> difficult for me – to find a path. I'm going to add Will Geary from Kansas State in there as well. 5'11", ran like a 5'6", at his pro day. 5'11", 300 yeah. pounds. So these are guys that were just pure production. I'm not going to bat for Geary. I w- I'll go to bat for Justin Lawler, though, because even though he's unathletic, he knows how to win with low pad level. He was our top-graded edge last year. And, again, it's like mid-round draft strategy. Do you want to draft a guy that's just the, the bag of tools that you want to try to put together? Or a guy that a guy like Lawler, who's going underappreciated because of the athleticism, but unless it's like detrimental athleticism, if you can win with your hands and pad level and be somewhat disruptive, there's a role in the NFL potentially. I'd rather have that guy on my roster, or maybe a combination of give me a couple of productive guys, give me a couple of those quote unquote high upside guys, and that's how I would build the roster when yeah. I'm GM, right? And again, I would want to take the guy that's proven to be good at certain things that you know are are necessary in the NFL. And see if he has the athleticism to get it done, as opposed to a guy who's got who's an athlete, but you've no idea if he can really do what you need him to do, or if you're going to be able to teach him to do that. Like to me, it seems it seems obvious you would take the guy who's already doing what you want, and then just hope he has the athleticism to still be able to do it at the next level, as opposed to a guy who's not doing what you want. You've no idea if he can do what you want, but he's a good athlete. So if you ever get him to the point where he's doing that stuff, he'll be really good. Yeah, it's just it's a I, no-brainer. I would, I would take more chances. And this is when we started PFF, this is what I envisioned, is certain teams at some point, instead of just taking chances on athletes and the whole like spark stuff that we've heard about the last couple of years and Seattle taking guys who are horrible football players who happen to be good athletes or basketball players, if what, it, what would happen if your day three, rounds you know four through seven, was just a whole bunch of productive players? Yeah. And it's, it, it's like the NFL thinks about it in the complete opposite way. I was telling you the other day, I was listening to Sirius NFL radio on the way back to my house, and Pat Kerwin was saying what he does, he takes the bench press, the broad jump, and the vertical jump, right? And he adds those three numbers up, and if you're over 70 in those three things, that proves you're explosive. So what he does is when he gets to day three, he's just looking for all the 70 guys because those are explosive athletes, and if you're an explosive athlete, you have a chance to make it in the NFL. Now, that's fine. And that's, I, I understand the logic in that. There's sense there. But how about instead if you had a way of finding the guys that were stupidly productive at the college level and you worked on that as your basis? So this guy has dominated at a lower level of competition. And we're going to see if that translates to the next level where the athletes are better and that kind of stuff. Now, I'm fine with imposing a threshold and saying, you know, if he's below this line in athleticism, we're not even going to go there. Yeah, right. But that would be my starting point as opposed to just, if he's a really good athlete, we'll see if he can play football. Yeah, so there are, there are a few really productive PFF type of guys over the last couple draft classes that haven't really had a major opportunities at the next level. So far, we've had good results with our guys translating at the next level at, across all positions. But again, I would maybe find I would I would find some of the PFF outliers, production outliers rather than the athleticism outliers. And again, for those people that say, well, people have had good college stats for years, sacks or passer rating or whatever it is. But this is different. We're not we're not judging. This isn't production based off stats. This has never been charted before production. Yeah, from a PFF. We're standpoint. not saying a guy that's had good statistics before is going to translate. It's a guy who has actually produced well before regardless of what the stats are if he's graded well if he's actually been performing well then let's give him a shot i have a ton of respect for pat Kerwin. yeah Um, he's on uh he leads he leads into us his show the uh moving the chain show on sirius leads into the pff show during the season on sirius ton of respect for pat and what he's done in the league throughout the years the 70 thing is hilarious to me though (laughs) i get the logic i just it no i you gotta look beyond that I can't wait to give it to the analytics guys, though. I mean, think about it, because if a guy benches 40 reps, 
He's already uh, 57% of the way to 70. Yeah, well, Harrison Phillips had, what, 48 reps or 44 reps or something this year? It's like led the combine. But there's no waiting in any of this? No, no, and he's most of the way there, regardless of what he does. Like, if he could fall over in a straight line, he's most of the way to 70, and he's not a tremendously explosive athlete. It's just fascinating. I love it. I think it's, uh, I think it's hilarious. Um, so uh, Joe Ostman is another edge defender out of Central Michigan, similar to Lawler. Uh, I know Mike's a little bit higher on him than he is Lawler, a little bit better workout, but again, one of our top graded guys. Two more guys to highlight. Wyatt Teller, guard out of Virginia Tech. Four straight years of unbelievable run blocking grades and improved in pass protection. I'm surprised he's not getting a little bit more because he's got that mean streak. He's the one that all the O-line guys should love. Nasty. He's got the nasty to him. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, one of the guys I've loved for a few years now, Colby Gossett out of Appalachian State. I told you, that's my school. Um, T. Sims is another guy out of Appalachian State. Only about 700 career snaps, but uber productive. But Gossett's a guy that caught my eye a couple of years ago. was our number two graded guard when he was a sophomore. And he makes like the difficult – I'm, I'm going to get a little NFL. He, he makes the difficult blocks look easy sometimes. The difficult reach blocks, is, blocks but misses some of the easy ones. Good zone fit at the next level, though, at guard. I got a name I want to add to your list. Boston Scott. Oh, yeah, little Boston. Running back out of Louisiana Tech, he's tiny, like comically small. He's five six, I think. Listed at 200. I don't know if that's generous or not, but it looks kind of generous. But some of his numbers and his grading in particular is insane. He's like the second highest graded running back in the nation last year. Um, <laughs> here's some context. He averaged 3.9 yards per carry after contact. So this is a guy that's five six, two hundred is making people miss and generating yards after guys get their hands on him. Nick Chubb last year, 3.8 yards per carry. So we're talking about his low center of gravity, his ability to burst through contact, have guys skittle off his legs. He averages less yards per contact last season than Boston Scott did. Um, and Scott, I think, has the ability to be a receiving weapon at the next level. He's a useful receiver. He's obviously shifty in space when you're small and don't weigh anything and people can't see you. It's going to help. Um, like his grading is insane. He's a guy I don't see anybody else talking about him. Like he's his grading is so high, and his what he does well is so good. I think we should be banging the table more for Boston. Also, he Do compares it. himself to Barry Sanders. If he, if he really is the next coming of Barry Sanders, then we should be out in front of that. Have we already covered this here? A little gonna, bit, yeah. We need to do some research on that. I'm just saying that if he's right and he is the second coming of Barry Sanders, we would look good if we were out in front of that. Yeah, we don't want to miss that. Bang, be good. Bang the table. There's a table for him. Boston. Sc- there you go. That must be annoying on Bang. the podcast. Yeah, well, that's what Chris does all day. Was. You remember? <laughs> Are you criticizing your boss? I'm just saying, anytime you get Chris that's Collinsworth in a meeting room and it's recorded, he finds a way to bang on something close to the microphone. So you think, you know, Fred Gudelli is his producer. You think Fred <laughs> like ties his hands behind I think his they back deliberately the keep him away from a table in that commentary booth so he can't hit things. When Before I moved over here and I had to dial in to the office for meetings and stuff, anytime Chris was in a meeting, whoever had the laptop or the Skype machine or the conference call phone, it, it was invariably positioned right next to Chris. Oh, and that's he would right. be slamming the table constantly throughout the call. Um, uh, quick aside, my favorite, my favorite night, Chris took us out uh, a couple combines ago. He just, he just bought the company and he was talking strategy for the company. We were trying to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And he was drawing on the table, kind of the, uh, our business plan. We, we had to like take the tablecloth with us. Was this like a disposable tablecloth or like fine? It was, no, it was, it was, it was disposable. It wasn't like a fine, you know, silk, uh, silk high end steakhouse. No, it was kind of like paper. It was kind of like papery. With. It was kind of papery. Right, yeah, so right. we were drawing the business plan on there. So Chris just uh, ma- he makes himself at home, yeah. wherever he is. Okay, I asked you guys for questions. Uh, Sam calls it the lazy way out, but yeah. my script got us a good chunk of the way through this thing, from what I've seen. Well, only because I didn't stick to your two minutes on Johnny Football. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, wanted to try to keep this tight, the but want to know. All right, couple questions we've got from uh, E Connor or something like that. <laughs> Econ R six. Troy Wands. I think it's Troy. Okay. Uh, who would you want, who should want to draft a quarterback, even though they don't think they need one? I think we both, ju- we, we ran to the podium to give this answer, right? Yeah. The Ravens. Yes. We, both, we were both thinking Ravens. Having said that, I do think that they kind of know that now. All right. So beyond that, so. And this is not even with the RG3 stuff. Like, uh, irrespective of the RG3 stuff, I think they know that the, the Joe Flacco time 
is at an end and yeah. they're just stuck and they're with still that contract. locked in they're still locked in for a little bit but the contract's not as bad as we thought it was maybe initially but if you present them with a quarterback option for the future i think they're interested is there another team in there i think we started this discussion off air before is there a certain point now how about if you're like the detroit lions and matthew stafford and this is not a knock on stafford who's a good quarterback he's a top 15 quarterback and i keep saying if you can find a top 15 quarterback at the top of the draft, like, hey, New York Giants, if you think there's a top 15 quarterback there, you have to get him. You can't pass that up, right? So they already have a top 15 quarterback. But now the talk is all about this rookie contract stuff. Matthew Stafford's not even close to a rookie contract. He's making huge money. He's like the lead, second lead, leading contract. I, you know what I'm saying. But so Second highest paid guy. So that's what I mean. So I know Kirk Cousins just signed with Minnesota for big money. Stafford's making big money in Detroit. We're talking about guys who maybe are like the 10th to 15th best quarterbacks in the NFL. Or if you're like Andy Dalton in Cincinnati, whose peak is 14th or 15th. So that's your one. Is that the other team? Oh, let's, but let, let's go back to the Stafford thing. We think Stafford's better than Dalton, right? Year in, year out, you can do more with him. Is there a point where it's just not worth the money and you roll the dice if you think that there's a guy that can be a top 15 quarterback? If you, got, if you think there's a guy that could be even comparable to Stafford, for a fraction of the money, is that a better strategy in today's NFL for team building? I think, yeah, probably is. It, they would be a team where I, you don't go looking for it. You, you know, you're not the team that goes trading up to try and find the guy. But if somebody falls into your lap in the first round, and you're Detroit, and you're paying Matthew Stafford as the best paid, second best paid quarterback in the league, knowing he's never going to get close to that level of quality, it's probably worth taking a shot at the guy. Let's say you miss. All you've done is cost yourself a first round of that year. You still got second through whatever. You still got plenty of picks to play with. And if you hit it, you get cheaper, you get better. And you just get out from under. And you get out from the, the huge contract. contract. I, yeah, so I the, think if a guy falls into your lap, you would definitely be wise to, to grab it. This feels like a whole separate show, too. That It is tough to get out from under those contracts, though. And it's also tough to actually find out if you hit or missed. Because you still have Matthew Stafford yeah. at this point. So it's risky. But I think it's a it's a fair question. Uh, the other t- so if you're the Oakland Raiders, they've already locked up Derek Carr. Is that a point where you just you should never lock up a guy until that rookie contract's done? Because you know the the pros and cons there. W- the next guy up is always the highest paid guy. Yeah. Like if you're if you're a top ten ish type of quarterback, whoever the next guy to hit the market is is going to be the highest paid guy. Derek Carr hit the market at a point where he had to become the highest paid guy. So. Do you go after two or three years, you're like, hey, you're our guy, let's just lock you in. Or kind of like what Jacksonville did with Bortles, he's not a top 10 guy, but you waited it all out, and then you said, okay, we'll pick up the fifth-year option and go from there. Well, the thing that was unusual about um, Carr is that he was one of those guys that actually did still make it to the top end of the second round. Typically now, it's you That's get true. taken in the first round, and if you don't, if you're not a top first-round pick, teams trade back into the bottom of the first to grab you so that they can pick up that fifth-year option. I forgot about the whole aspect. Carr still lasted to pick 36, still into the second round, so the Raiders were like a year behind the eight ball in terms of having to get something done, whereas the Jags can just sit on it knowing that they've got a fifth-year option to pick up. Um, Then they can franchise the guy at the back end of that. There's just so much more flexibility. Um, The Raiders kind of were in a different spot because of that. Okay, so the only other teams I can think of are the Miami Dolphins in there? Because it seems like they're already they're testing the waters, yeah. right? They're in that Tannehill mid tier type of mode. Is it is it time to move on there? And then it's all the t- the teams with old quarterbacks who I think know it: the Steelers, the Chargers, the Saints. You want one more? Yeah, the Indianapolis Colts. Do they know that they need one? It stubs the question. Who don't know, right? even though they don't think they need to draft one. I don't think they, they might think that. know if, if Andrew Luck, as reported today, has not thrown more than a Nerf. Is, I'm assuming it's a Nerf football if it's not a regulation. They didn't say. I would say, well, maybe, thrown, maybe it's the mini ones that I have to throw. That could be it. You fumbled that, too. I had to do all the push-ups on Instagram that Only one Only in the studio. I don't fumble in the real games. Yeah, true. Um, Andrew Luck has not thrown a regulation size football. I Honestly, I mean, I don't have his rehab schedule. I don't know if that's <laughs> alarming or not. Well, that was the same thing last year. It came out, you know... Everyone assumed Andrew Luck was on on schedule to start 2017. Then it was, uh, he hasn't actually thrown a football yet. That's all right. He'll be fine. I believe them and this that, year. I really wanted to believe them this year. Well, I believed them last year, so now I'm less inclined to believe them this year. Now it's two years that he's surprisingly not thrown a football yet. And, like, okay, we're only kind of just into the offseason, but we're not that many months away from, like, 
getting hit and playing football. If you can't pick up a ball yet and throw it down the field, I, I, I'm no doctor either, but that doesn't sound great. So in my world of just grab the best players, if Baker Mayfield's there at six and you're the Indianapolis Colts. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Even though Jacoby Brissett is one of the most accurate QBs in, in the game. Where did he turn up on the QB charting, by the way, the advanced accuracy stuff? I think it was somewhere between 12 and 15. Okay. Actually. So vaguely solid. accurate. He was okay. Um, poor decision making last year, though. Remains intriguing. Remains intriguing. <laughs> I honestly think after watching Brissett for a year, you know, about a year in a couple games, he lands on that, like, maybe the best backup in the yeah, NFL yeah, yeah. spectrum. Which makes it still a really smart trade from the Colts perspective. Oh, if you could take, if you get him for Philip Dorsett, yeah. who is pretty much a waste of a first round pick, absolutely. It's a great trade. Um, but I think he ends up. I think but still like, puts him in the QB market if it turns out luck is just a, a shoulder break. Correct. Jacoby Brissett is not going to keep me from drafting a quarterback drafting to replace quarterback. Andrew Luck if exactly. it turns out he's knackered. If, if I think a guy's better than Brissett. All right, a couple more questions. Michael D. Smith, big fan of the show. A lot of good interactions from Michael over these last few weeks. Chubb, Penny, and Geis, who, if any, could be a serviceable receiver at the level of, say, Gurley, any other receivers, excluding Saquon and Sony Michelle, that you can see as a third, uh, three down back. So I think all three of those guys can be reasonable NFL receivers. I don't think any of them have problems in that area. The one guy, in fact, of the sort of top group that I'm, I have concerns about is Ronald Jones, who basically wasn't a factor at all in that USC passing game. Not necessarily because he can't be, just he wasn't. That's just not what they did with the ball. He only got the ball if they needed to dump it off to a guy who just happened to be in acres of space when the play broke down. He was only at, I think, 45 targets or something in his entire USC career, but there were some ugly drops in there despite only 45 targets. So I would be concerned about whether he can be a valuable receiver at the next level, which I think he'll need to be because he's not the biggest running back in the world, and I don't really want him having every time he touches the ball just power up into traffic. I think that would be bad for his long-term future. Um, as for the other part, what other top running backs can I see as three down backs? Um, Royce Freeman is the other obvious name that jumps off that list. I think he can be a really good every down back, can definitely work as a receiver. Um, maybe not to the Saquon Barkley kind of level where he's a, a mismatch nightmare, but definitely to the Todd Gurley level where you can be a really useful outlet and do damage after the catch. Yeah, and then the other guys that I see lower on the list might be just receivers at the next level, like a Kalen Pelage. Uh, I'm not saying Mark Walton's just a receiver, but these are guys that you're more going to integrate into your pass game from Balaj, Walton, Edo Smith. Edo Smith, Naheem Hines maybe. I mean, there's a lot more guys that uh, maybe not three down guys, but maybe you know make their Boston money. Boston Third down Scott. guy. Boston Scott, pound that, pound that table for him. Might be a guy that uh, affects the pass game. Uh, we have a question from Team Kirk that's at Mad City Viking. So he jumped on the Cousins bandwagon, yeah. you see. Any day two to three wide receivers that might not offer much in the way of a route tree, <laughs> but could have an early impact as a deep threat. So we're talking day two and three, but we're going to mention a name that people have as their top receiver on this crazy wide receiver board. DJ Chark. Yeah. Out of LSU. Some people are all over that. He go, he, he's another one of these guys that goes from, you know, intriguing skill set. Uh, there's parts of me that think he might be a better version of Will Fuller. Will Fuller went, went in the, the first, first round. round. Went in the first round. Shouldn't have, but did. But we didn't want him in the first round, right? And I don't know that he's been worth the first round pick because he's just a he's a pure speed guy. It's, it hasn't been a disastrous pick by any means. Pretty sure you were talking him up because you like fast guys. Oh, no, not me. That was Renner. No. That was Mike. Pretty sure you were all out. Oh, Mike was all over it. Mm. With Fuller. Well, he was because he went to Notre Dame. I was poking. I was trying to poke holes on why you hated him, maybe. Because he didn't catch. Yeah, but has he caught at the NFL? It's been okay. A little bit. Yeah, because drops are overrated. Anyway, uh, DJ Chark has the deep speed, 4-3-4 four, four at, uh, at the combine. It shows up on the field. And he can catch. And he's, he can catch, and he has contested ball skills. But you, met, you had one note from the senior ball that really scared me about how you said he, the way he's setting up corners and all that stuff. I've never seen a wide receiver less who has less of an idea how to play a cornerback's leverage than DJ Chark. It's like he has no earthly idea what to do about the guy that's covering him. Like, if he can run by him, fine. He's perfect because he's just faster and more athletic than the guy. But if he has to actually <laughs> maneuver the corner around or get him out of his way by route running, 
no chance. Doesn't even know how to go about it. Just it's like random. But the deep speed thing. So to me, being a deep receiver is way more than just speed. Because one of the things we love about James Washington, he might not blow by guys, but you, like you always say, he's got a second gear, but also just knows how to keep a cornerback on his hip. He knows how to stack him. He knows how to use his body. And that was one of those things. I didn't think Will Fuller had a great feel for that. He could run yeah. right by guys. But a good deep receiver knows how to use their hands and their body, and that's what, that's what turns them into good deep receivers. Mike Wallace is the same thing. Pure speed, yeah. so but doesn't necessarily use his body. But Chark uses his body better than most guys that have that type of speed. There's that aspect of it. But then the other aspect of that is, is the Calvin Ridley stuff, where he just he understands completely how to set up defensive backs whether it's zone or man coverage he understands how his route running can move the db to somewhere he doesn't want him to be or he he wants him to be and then right. cut somewhere else chark just doesn't have that it's like those are two ends of the spectrum you got ridley over here who understands intuitively how to do it regardless of the coverage regardless of the guy trying to cover him and you've got chark here who's like i'm running this route and if you happen to be in my way at the time i'm screwed so Chark would be the guy that we're highlighting. I like what you said about Ridley. Uh, one of the other things about Ridley, too, doesn't he didn't have the best lateral uh, workout, essentially, lateral movement workout. But again, the, the way we watch him running routes and how scared corners are of that speed, he's got those guys running in circles. It almost doesn't matter if he's got the sharpest cuts no. in and out of breaks. And I don't think his breaks on routes are that bad. Any, or maybe it's not as bad as the workouts would show anyway. No, I don't, I don't care about that number having looked at his tape. If, if you have the guy back, you know, running backwards at the time because you, you're scaring the guy deep, it doesn't matter if you turn like a barge to cut it off and turn it into an out. He's still not right. going to be there. All right, one last question. Uh, my friend Joseph, who's been uh, uh, n- another good interactions on Twitter uh, right here during, uh, during draft season. Joseph uh, Telegan? Telegan? I don't, I don't know how to pronounce names, as sure. you know. Uh, yes, 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 please. That's in response to, do you have any burning <laughs> questions? Could you address your quite low grade on Colton Miller? That's the UCLA offensive tackle, as it affects the Patriots' first-round picks for sure. Uh, Colton Miller is a guy, again, depending on who you talk to, you see first-round First round. I mean, there's, there's hypothetical first-rounders for 100 guys, depending on where you look. Um, has great size. Had an unbelievable combine from an athleticism standpoint. He had probably just one good, he had one year good year of grading from uh, in, in our system. Wasn't great in 2016. Uh, Mike Renner did a lot of the work on him. Doesn't love him as much as some of the other tackles in this class. Yeah, and too big okay. or too too tall, not big enough. Plays a little high. We didn't really see him in uh, a ton of challenging pass pass blocking situations. I think he's a solid player. I think ultimately he's going to move up a little bit on our board the more work we've done on him, but probably doesn't land in the first round like some of the other guys. Seems fair. All right, that's it. We had one more question. Um, this guy, Rick, at Top Gun 2448 he said, who should my Bengals take at 21? Ragnow. Also, we're going to tell you on the Bengals podcast with Paul Daner. That too. Ragnow. Week. We're going to record that. Okay, Frank Ragnow. Center slash guard out of Arkansas. That'll do it for us. Your uh, PFF draft podcast is complete don't forget version two of the draft guide is up right now over 500 pages including our very special quarterback accuracy charting on the top draft eligible quarterbacks it's all part of pff edge and don't forget you can get elite with premium stats also comes with the draft guide and our qb annual and all that fun stuff get it all at profootballfocus.com all right guys we'll talk again next time